Yeah, it's on. Everybody in the back hear me? Can't hear me? All right. First of all, I want to say this is my favorite conference of the year. Of um, I come to each year. I really enjoy it. Lots of stuff I learn um, while I'm here. And um, la uh, last time I gave a talk, it was so good that they had to shut down the world for three years. So, uh, so we're finally back. Hopefully, that doesn't happen after this talk. Uh, so, uh, basically, I'm going to give a talk on containers on wheels. Um, um, I like to think of myself as the Ursula of containers. Um, basically, I started out getting containers into Fedora, then into RHEL, then into OpenStack, OpenShift, Ansible, and now into a thing called Rivos. Um, so containers on wheels, we call ourselves the cow team. Um, so it's part of automotive. I basically nine months ago, I. Uh, moved out of the container, uh, container leadership, um, the Podman team and all the low-level container stuff, and I moved over to auto, um, mainly because I thought the container team was, much, you know, was ready to go on their own and didn't need me in the way anymore. And now I'm working on uh, auto, but really just continue to work on containers and all things. So we call it the Red Hat and Vehicle Operating System. Uh, everybody calls it Rivos. We're still not sure if we're supposed to use that outside of Red Hat, but Anyways, we're not supposed to use RHEL outside of Red Hat either, and that's not worked well. Uh, last year at the Red Hat Summit, there was an announcement of a big agreement between Red Hat and General Motors, um, basically to look at getting a uh, Red Hat-based operating system into all of their cars going forward. Um, we have a lot of interest from a lot of car um, manufacturers and OEMs um, in the car. They're all looking at what we're doing. They're very excited about it. Um, and, but we picked General Motors as our customer number one, mainly to control the amount of requi you know, requirements and gathering. Uh, what we plan to do is over the next year and a half, um, basically design the operating system with General Motors and then we'd open it up to other car companies and other OEMs and potentially other moving vehicle type things. So um, this is all part of the uh, greater uh, Red Hat Edge operating system. Uh, so this gives you, a, we're building an operating system here, or we're basically taking RHEL as the operating system, and then General Motors is building all sorts of stuff on top. When I talk about this, um, what's the software they're going to be running in these vehicles, we're talking things like self-driving uh, cars, uh, all the sensors, all of the um, infotainment systems, all different types of software. Uh, but at the bottom line, we're doing things with, you know, uh, System D and Podman and uh, adding new features like Composer Vest that I'll cover and a lot of these other functions in this talk. Um, so basically, Rivos is a binary distribution based on Red Hat Enterprise Linux. We're not building a brand new operating system. We're taking all the basis of, of RHEL and moving it into uh, automobiles. And really what we're trying to do is move towards justifying that the operating system that runs in your vehicle um, could be RHEL. Uh, one their key difference, at least the default, is that we're going to be using the real-time kernel. And in, uh, as we talk about uh, what it means to run an operating system in a car, you'll find out why we have to use the real-time kernel. Uh, we're also planning on using OS images built by customers. So think, of, I mean, we'll keep this quiet, but it's core OS in a car. Um, so it's going to be an image-based system based on OS tree um, uh, using atomic updates. We want to have an immutable operating system. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. We want basically the main operating system to re be read-only from the processes running inside of it. And the operating, we really are stressing that it has to be container-friendly. So we really want to run a lot of containers. All the applications that we run inside the vehicle, or most of the applications in it, are going to be containerized. So the biggest hurdle to getting uh, RHEL into a car is a, thing called, a little thing called functional safety. And functional safety, um, this is the, uh, if you go to Wikipedia and look up what functional safety is, it's functional safety is a process of reducing the risk, both simple and complex systems, so they function safely in hardware. So this is fundamentally different, similar to security, but in some ways different. What we're trying to do here is we're trying to build into a moving vehicle, I mean, build an operating system in a moving vehicle that is as safe as possible, right? We don't want the, so the, the 
the machine to cause injury to someone. So we want to look at making sure that there's no, uh, or as, as, li as little possibility of you know, something going wrong in the software system that could hurt a person. So that's what really what we're talking about with functional safety. Um, and traditional functional safety, and this is one of the reasons the car companies have, have had a big hurdle to get new software into vehicles, um, was that you would have to design, write your design documents for the entire um, CPU, the entire operating system. Then you would have to code to produce, to match those requirements. And then you would have to test the code uh, over very, you know, uh, uh, to make sure that the code works as designed. So the thing of that is like the old fashioned waterfall design and everything had to be built from scratch. So what the car companies have had to do is they constantly are redoing building an operating system, right? Redoing it and, and it just takes forever uh, for them to be able to do it. And um, so they wanted to move to a new system. Um, so from a Linux point of view, right? Is there any design document for Linux? Anybody got a design document for the kernel? And Linus put out a document 25 years ago, I guess. So it, wasn't, it you know, really wasn't designed, right? It just evolved. And um, so Linux system is already written without any real design document, so it doesn't fit into the traditional functional safety model. Uh, we have no, we, we, but basically what we're doing is we're documenting um, the functional safety APIs, the fu basically the APIs that we tell General Motors to use when they're running the vehicle and they can run it in a safe mo mode. Um, and guess how we're documenting the APIs? We have a little thing called man pages. So we're basically going through all the man pages, making sure they're accurate for the functional calls in things like glibc. And then we look at the code, and then we look at make sure there's test suites to make sure the code. So basically, that's part of our argument for functional safety. We're also looking at arguments like you know this stuff is used for many many years. This is the, the open source that the kernel is probably the most examined piece of code on the planet, right? So looking at you know, the way open source develops and, and that it's, it's basically a functionally, you know, safe uh, environment. So we have to make all these arguments and document it, and then we have to get other companies to basically come in and say, yeah, you've proven that, fun uh, that Linux is designed as a functionally safe operating system. So other than functional safety, we also have to do a thing called, we need, have a need for speed here. When you turn on your car, Within two seconds, you hear a beep that tells you to put your safety belt on. Well, if that's coming from an operating system, that means the operating system, the hardware has to start, get settled, load the kernel, and at some point after that, we have to emit a sound to the, uh, to the speaker to tell you to put the seat belt on. If you put the car into reverse, within two seconds, the backup camera has to be on. So we have to be able to boot an operating system or bring an operating system out of hibernation within two seconds. And that's a fundamental uh, thing. Now, if we're running containers on top of that, we also have to look at how quickly a container starts up. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of our focus has been around speed. Um, and we, in the Podman team, we wanted to run things in containers. And we did some testing on the base of the lowest uh, possible standard, uh, system. Uh, a Raspberry Pi with very little memory, and Podman took two seconds to start a container. So you hit Podman, hit return, it takes two seconds. That's way too slow. So we basically went in, into the code and just looked at every piece of code, all the way it was, used all sorts of tools to analyze it, and we found all sorts of little speed ups, but we're talking microseconds, right? But we found hundreds of them, um, and then we were able to achieve a six times speed up. So we got it down to about 0.3 seconds. So now you can start with Pod, Podman in the upstream Podman right now, you can start a container within 0.3 seconds on a very low uh, uh, power system. Now for most human beings, it doesn't matter, right? If you have Podman, it takes a second to start a container, you're not even thinking about it. But when you're talking about you know, the overhead of starting uh, containers in a car, um, you have to you know, look at speed all the time. So car, these cars are not gonna have one computer and they're probably gonna have, well right now they have hundreds of computers in them. And the, 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 one of the things the car companies want to do is they want to consolidate down to um, a few computers and then have the computers analyze, you know, basically using sensors all over the place. Um, so these cars are going to have multiple, no, multiple nodes, so how do you want to manage those services? Oops. I don't know what just happened.
working on. Oop. So what do you think about Kubernetes in a car? Right? So both, a lot of the car companies came to us and said, you know, what we really want is we want sort of Kubernetes in a car or we want cloud native computing. We want to be able to put all these cool, cool whiz things and have the car constantly updating. Um, and uh, we came back and looked at Kubernetes in a car and then we looked at functional safety. So Kubernetes has the concept of eventual consistency. Okay, so the system will be eventually in the correct state. So, <laughs> so the braking system will eventually work. Okay, and so that's <laughs> probably not what we want for it. Uh, the other problem is you're taking a huge Go program that's constantly monitoring, constantly working on it, and trying to justify that you know, this multi-threaded behemoth is functionally safe, um, is pretty much, you know, not going to happen. Um, not going to happen in the time frame that we want to get this product out the door. Um, so Kubernetes, um, so we actually wrote an article, Pierre, myself, and Alex Lassen wrote an article back in October because lots of these communities were forming around Kubernetes in a car. And we wrote an article that said that it, it just ain't going to happen. We don't believe that that's the correct, the correct route for um, running it. Um, but we, we have this really cool orchestrator that orchestrates lots of your system, right? The starts and stops services all the time uh, called System D. And so we're really looking at uh, can I have an application profile? So my application, one profile can run one or more applications. I can have an app, one application can have one or more System D services as defined for it. Um, and then I have a capability to switch between different pro profiles or different. different um, uh, targets. Um, so think of it when you boot up your system, right? So your system D goes into boot up mode, it starts, and st starts a bunch of services, and then you go from there to the network mode, so it brings up network, it might have shut down some other services. Um, when it switches from network mode, it goes to multi-user mode, so it turns on some services, turns off some services, and finally goes to graphical user mode, it turns on services, turns off services. So that's the way system D works, but how about system D in a car? So all the features that we just talked about, you know, multiple applications run underneath system services, um, but now I start the car. So it's going to start up certain server. I might uh, click on sensors, um, do, you know, turn on the cameras, things like that. Um, then I put the car into reverse. So I put the car into reverse. It's going to start certain services, shut down certain services, turn on the backup camera, turn on the backup sensors. Then I'm going to put the car into drive. Again, it's going to turn off the backup camera. So all these targeted run levels all can be handled just using standard, standard way the system D runs, starting and stopping services. Um, so sing, system D for a single node uh, is the way we're telling General Motors that they should do it, and then just build services, and you can build the relationship between the services um, that are going to run the different pieces of software they're going to be running. But system D runs for a single node, but Rivos is going to be multi-node. So how do we get multi-node capabilities into system, uh, into system D or into Rivos? So we need to extend the system D concepts across multiple nodes. And so we built a brand new project called Herte, or Herter, or however the Germans want to pronounce it, because it's a German word. And it's a German word for she shepherd or a herder. Um, and really, there's, there's two major components of it. So the first one is a Herte agent, which is going to run on each one of the nodes. Um, and eventually, it might even be running more than one on each one of the nodes. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, so a Herte agent is just going to be out there, and it just talks to System D, and it talks back to Herte on the server. So you're going to have a main processor that's running Herte, and then you're going to have Herte agents running anywhere, and basically it's just going to be a, uh, like a spoke-designed uh, system where um, we can have uh, bi-directional communications from the main node out to the agents. And all the agent's going to do is basically relay messages to System D. So the way you talk to System D is via D-Bus. Um, so uh, we're going to be, you know, Herte is going to be talking constantly back and forth to these agents and just relaying System D messages back and forth between them. Uh, we have a uh, test program, a CLI, a tool, but uh, Herte Control, uh, which is Herte CTL, uh, which is very, uh, it's based on System CTL. So again, We'd be basically taking what system CTL does and expanding it to go to all the different nodes. And to give you an idea of what the architecture looks like, here we have 
Um, this state manager is sort of what General Motors is going to give. So j this is the thing that's waiting for the human being to say, put the car, in, you know, start the car, put the car in reverse. Um, and it's going to talk to, via D-Bus, to Herta, the, Herta, the main Herta server. And that Herta server is then going to talk to a Herta agent, and that Herta agent is going to talk to System D, and System D will start the services. It'll also go over, uh, extend D-Bus over T TCP and talk to Herta agents on each one of the nodes, and similarly, we'll be just relaying those D-Bus messages around the environment. Uh, so that this Herta agent will tell this System D to go into reverse mode, tell this one to go into reverse mode. If a service crashes for, what, for any reason, then system D here is going to realize it's going to tell Herte agent that, some, that a service crashed. That's going to be really laid back to Herte, and that's going to go up to the state manager to say some service crash, right? So if you're, you're driving along at 60 miles an hour, and all of a sudden your sensors go down, you know, your self-driving mode, your sensors go down, you know, service crashes for whatever reason, that General Motors has, the General Motors application has to be notified, and then the car is no longer safe, so it has to go into you know, some reduced mode. So think you're in self-driving mode, and this is when it tells the human being to take over. Human being, I, I can't do self-driving anymore. Something bad happened. So we had to build this entire system. And it's real, uh, if you go to GitHub containers slash Herte, uh, this is a, uh, uh, it's available there. It's fairly simple, it's fairly elegant. It's written in C, again, because functional safety. We have to build code in non-multi-threaded environments. So when we're talking to General Motors, we're also gonna tell them you know, how we think they should build their applications. So a lot of people, you know, we're talking structured language that we want to run on the environment. So what structured language should you run for, use for running these applications? And the answer is Kubernetes. So we want to use Kubernetes structured language in order to run containers on the car. Um, so we're really talking about Kubernetes YAML. Now Podman has full support for Kubernetes YAML, understands how to set up containers and pods on Kubernetes YAML. Uh, and the nice thing is if we build on Kubernetes YAML, then General Motors or any car company then could use OpenShift for running all the CI CD systems. So they could run, take the same app, same definition of the application that's going to run in the vehicle, run it in the cloud and run it all sorts of tests on it, even have OpenShift maybe running native, uh, the actual native operating system and run some of the tests on that environment. So using Kubernetes as sort of a scheduler for all your testing environment but we have the same language um, all the way up and down the stack. Podman supported Kubernetes for many years now, so Podman has a tool, uh, Podman Kube Generate, and more importantly, Pod Kube Play can take the same Kubernetes YAML files that Kubernetes understands and run Podman with it. So when we want to run, we want to run Podman underneath System D, we needed a, an, uh, we, did, we decided to build a better way of running Podman inside of System D, and that's called Quadlet. And to give you an idea where that comes from, if you play with Kubernetes at all, what do you, what do you call it when you take a kublet, which is the way you meant, and squash it down? You call it a Quadlet. Okay, that's where the name comes from. Real clever engineers. So this is an example of a Quadlet, and this is, this is in Podman now. Uh, full support. This, you don't have to get rivals for this. It's a full support. Uh, anybody that's played with Podman in the past, Podman had Podman si generate systemd, and that would take uh, running containers and running pods and would generate a systemd unifile, which had sort of our best knowledge at the time we wrote it of how to run containers underneath systemd. The problem is that thing in, then becomes a static document, right? It's a static service running on it. Um, so when some of the uh, rivals engineers looked at Podman sy generate system D, they said, well, there's a better concept inside of system D called a generator. And what a generator can do is you can define something that looks like a standard system D unit file, and then when system D, you, you define an executable, put an executable in place, and when system D does a system, um, systems control daemon reload, it'll run these generators that can take something that looks like this, a quadlet, and actually generate a systemd service file off of it. So now we get to have a fairly simple definition of what a container is. So I'm just putting a container here, it's UBI 9 minimum, and I'm doing an exec of sleep inside of it. So that's really simple. And what that will actually generate is here, you, this is the actual service that that generates. So you can see the uh, original code here coming in, but it generates a real fancy Podman command here. And it does all sorts of systemd weirdness 
to make this work. And uh, basically, this is all the knowledge that the Podman team has, has worked with the Systemd team to figure out how to run uh, Podman underneath a Systemd environment. I'm already down to 10 minutes. That's got to move it. OK, so uh, Quadlets also support um, uh, running Kubernetes in the environment. So we can run Podman Play Kube. And again, this is built in uh, totally into the system. Um, so we're using quadlets all over the place for running containers. And now the last concept that we had to work on was a, a concept in the vehicle is called freedom from interference. And what freedom of interference means is we have two types of software that are going to run in a, in a vehicle. You have uh, sort of the functional safe co code, and that's called automotive safety integrity level otherwise known as ASL. So you'll hear this term ASL or ASL A, ASL B, ASL C, and ASL D. So these are standard ways of you want to run functionally safe code. We're only documenting rel up to ASL B. Yeah, um, so, but basically that means all the software that's used for like self-driving vehicle, things like that can do. Um, my example of, of the brake eventually applying, that's actually bogus because that would be ASL D and we're not putting that in, in, our, uh, in our description here. But the second part of code, code, code that runs or applications that run in your vehicle are going to be call, uh, called quality managed, which basically means they're quality code, but they might not be functionally safe. So when I want to run quality code, and think of this as being your infotainment uh, software. So this is probably, in, in Rivos, we're, we're describing that you might want to run your, um, say, your uh, you know, infotainment software inside of your know, uh, Android operating system types code inside of a VM running inside of the QM environment. Other things that might be QM are like uh, that little heat seat, uh, the, the seat heater uh, app, you know, application. So you press it on to turn your heat seat or maybe the windows going up and down. Any type of software like that that's not really involved in, in necessarily making the car safe, um, but it's, it's uh, use. And there's other applications that General Motors wants. That, and eventually, the car companies want to make this a money maker for them. Right, so they want to sell you software in the vehicle that they could use, and that software is probably going to come in the form of, you know, uh, well, it come into Azel and QM. Um, but basically, we have to take the QM software and we have to isolate it from the rest of the car. So we're designing an operating system um, with two different instances running inside of it. Uh, so you have the ASL software, and that's going to be running lots and lots of containers. And then you have the QM section that's also going to be running lots and lots of containers. Um, so we had to design a sort of a sub-environment to run for the QM. Um, now, we could use virtualization for running this, but um, a lot of the ASL applications want to control the QM applications. So it has to be heavy in communication between the two environments. So we've decided at this point to use containerization to isolate the QM environment from it. Um, so if you want to isolate an app, say you're running, driving along in your car, someone steps off a curb, it's going to launch an application to know that you know, in the uh, functional safe environment that that human being is there. Simultaneously, you're saying, uh, uh, turn the heat, seat, the, the heat uh, seat up, which might launch a container and run it. So how do I make sure that System D, which is probably doing both operations, is isolated? How do I make sure that Podman coming up and that starting the container is isolated? So we really need to isolate the entire stack from uh, the environment. So we're, we're describing running uh, System D, uh, a separate System D instance, a separate fully Podman instance, and this is how we're doing it. So this next section is all going to be defining how we're setting up a QM, and we're using quadlets for it. So a quadlet, uh, this is the QM container, and if you go to GitHub containers slash QM, you can actually, die, actually you can install QM um, right now on your systems, on your Fedora 38 systems. Um, so QM is basically setting up a systemd unit file, again a quadlet, um, that looks like this. The top pack is all things that go uh, standard systemd commands for setting up things like cgroups to isolate these environments, and the bottom part is all the fields that we're using for um, setting up Podman, basically. So the first thing we're going to look at inside of this slice is we want to identify the um, entire C group or the entire environment that's going to be running your QM environment in your car. So we're just going to name a QM slice. And then you can do things, special things with C groups, like the top one here actually says, I'm going to run all my applications in the QM. And in this case, my laptop has 12 
virtual CPUs on it, and I'm just saying I'm only going to run uh, on the bottom six CPUs. Now, the rest of the ASL environment can use one, you know, 0 through uh, 11. They can use all the CPUs, but the QMs can only run on that. This is easily changeable by General Motors. If they wanna, only want to use two of the CPUs, they can do that. Um, similar CPU weight. So CPU weight basically says um, in, in, uh, in uh, C groups, a CPU weight goes from zero to um, 200, and the default uh, CPU weight is 100. So if you set your CPU weight to 50 in your C group, that means all the processes inside the QM are going to get one slice for every two, slice, two slices that the um, system gets. Um, then I can do IO weight, very similar. That's again, that, and these numbers can be changed, right? You can set it to 10 and get 10 times as much. The next thing I want to quickly uh, mention is the, the idea of uh, uh, um killer. So OOM killer is the, uh, when you're running in C groups, if you start to run out of memory on the system, the kernel can't take memory away from a process. All it can do is shoot it in the head. So what we want to do in uh, the QM environment is say, you know, I am the Katniss, right? Pick me. Pick me to kill. So, so by setting these scores, uh, and the car goes from, uh, OOM killer goes from minus 1,000 to plus 1,000, uh, all, all processes run with zero, and what we're saying here is anything in the QM is going to get priority to be killed over the rest of the system. The last thing I want to show in the system D part of it is we're defining where the, um, you know, where the software is. Uh, we're not going to be using an OCI image for this environment. We're actually installing the software directly on disk, and so the di software is going to go into user lib uh, root of us, and um, then in the container section of it, we refer back to that rootFS. So this is how the connection goes inside of the, uh, the quadlet. Um, now we're in the pod, this is the, these are the commands that Podman's going to interpret on the system. So the first thing we need to do is name the entire container, and that's going to be named QM. Uh, we want to run systemd as the primary process inside of this containerized environment. Um, we also want to, sh in this case, we're probably going to share the host network, because it just adds complexity. Um, we can uh, adjust the amount of capabilities they're going to run in the container. Uh, probably we want to run a lot of privileged, somewhat privileged processes in here, so we're going to leak in all the capabilities, or we're going to be able to run containers. Uh, we can add, add special devices, so if you want to have special devices go in. We want to run read-only for the entire environment, except we have to have read-writable Etsy and VAR, so these are the ways you can set up uh, a read-only uh, petition and then have Etsy and VAR be read-writable. And finally, we want to have SE Linux running inside of the, uh, inside of the QM. We want to isolate uh, containers in the QM from each other and from the host uh, operating system. So all that stuff generates a huge, that, that, um, a huge Podman command line to basically show how all that quadlet uh, gets converted. So the last thing that we have in the QM package is a big setup script that sets up this entire QM environment. And I'm going to start that up as I run out of time. So everybody get off the network so this will work fast. All right, so QM is the standard package inside of, of um, uh, Rel, uh, Fedora 38. I'm running the script now. This script is going to go out and actually install all the software that I'm about to demonstrate. Um, so. That setup script that I'm running right now is actually going to do, oops, skip ahead. Um, it's going to install rootfs, so I'm dropping all the files in. Uh, so I actually destroyed that entire directory and I'm reinstalling it right now. Uh, these are the only packages we're putting in the QM. So we have SE Linux policy because we want to run SE Linux in it. Uh, we have Podman systemd and we have a Herte agent because we want the Herte in the system to manage the Herte agent to manage that system D. So we'll have two system Ds running in inside each one of these environments. Um, this is the software we're installing on the system right now. Um, so that there's a DNF up update that's installing those packages. Um, this script can be run multiple times to actually update the software after the fact. Uh, we're also installing a containers.conf, which is a way we can reconfigure Podman inside of the QM. And there's a couple of key fields in here. So this tells Podman to, uh, again, do uh, um, set up memory C groups. So that's also the Katniss. Um, so the t this does two things in the environment. 
Now, if you recall, QM was 500. Now we set up all the containers as being 750, which again means these containers, each container should be killed before the QM is killed. Um, the memory OOM C group also tells the kernel to kill, kernel usually kills just processes, um, but if you set that flag in the C groups, it tells it to kill actual containers running in the environment or entire, entire C groups. Um, so lastly, in the, in the setup script, we're also setting up, we want to take advantage of user namespace, um, so we want to make sure that UIDs are different from a QM environment, from an ASL environment. So we're picking out 1.5 billion uh, UIDs to run containers in, and we're picking out a different 1.5 billion. So if you look up here, uh, I've allocated from 1 billion to 1.5 uh, billion, starting at 1 billion UIDs for the container, and then I'm doing 2.5 uh, 2 billion, and then 1.5 billion on there. To give you an idea, there's 4 billion UIDs available to, on, on a Linux system. Uh, so the last thing we do is we set up Herta, and Herta, all we're doing is we're saying Herta inside of the QM environment is going to have the same name as Herta outside of the QM environment with the QM dot uh, prepended on it. Okay, so that finished the install of a system. I'm actually showing the QM service is up and running. So this is a, a quadlet that generated a service, and the service is now up and running on the system. If I look at the CPU weight, remember we talked about uh, setting the priority of CPUs, so I set it to 50. Well, the nice thing is from the ASL environment, if they want more priority during the running of the car, something's happening, I need to squash down the entire QM environment, you can do that with C groups. So I'm just going to set CPU weight of 50, I'm changing it to 10, and now all of, the, all of the, my QM environment has dropped down to only 10, so that means for every... 10, slice, 10 slices of the CPU, the QM's only going to get one. Uh, what's interesting here is you see that a service running under the QM still has 50, but that's actually a sub of the 10. So it's only going to get 50% of the 10%. Um, so everything is, is isolated inside the environment. Here I'm showing what the QM looks like. So I just did a Podman uh, exec of, uh, to show you the processes running in it. Uh, we're running with a separate SE Linux label, so it's running as QMT. And now I'm actually running a, if you see the Podman exec in front, that's basically saying run Podman inside of the QM. So I just ran a container inside of the QM environment. Um, I ran another container, in, uh, I ran a container outside of the QM environment in the ASL environment. Um, and to show you that there's two different um, Podmans running, two, two different databases, I show the difference in the images in the environment. So this is showing you using user namespace, so I can actually run lots of containers inside of the QM environment. And notice that they all start with one billion something. Each one is, uh, has a separate UID range. And now if I run on the host, um, I've said my system isn't quite what the documentation is, but you can see that they're running um, at 500 million. Um, so the containers on the ASL are running with different user namespaces than inside the container. I'm out of time, so I'm not gonna show this. Um, so with Herte set up on the system, um, here's Herte running, and this is just listing all the running services on it. So my, my laptop's called Fedora, and down the bottom you'll see all the services running inside of the QM, uh, QM Fedora. So what I can do is I can actually run, so now I'm going to demonstrate pulling down inside of the QM environment, I'm pulling down a uh, UBI8 Apache service. Um, just pulling down the image into the uh, Podman database. And good, you were all off the network. That's good. OK, now I'm setting up a quadlet. So I'm just defining a simple quadlet to run that uh, Apache service that I just downloaded. And I'm setting two fields in it, just the name of this image that I did. And I'm just setting up network equals host. So it can use, be run on the host network. Now I'm using Podman copy to copy the file that I created in the ASL environment into the container environment. I'm doing a Podman exec to do a system control daemon reload inside of the QM environment. So that basically triggered um, the quadlet to become a service. Now I'm actually going to start the service via Herta control. So Herta control is saying restart that new my quadlet service I just generated, and it's, it can do it to the QM environment. Um, and then, so I'm going to list out, and I'm showing that the service is now running inside of the QM environment, and I can curl. No, 
not a great demo, but it's running, basically shows Apache is running inside of the, Hurt, inside of the QM environment. Um, I can stop it with Herta control. I can list units and show that they're all done. And that is the end of the presentation, except for a shameless plug to buy my book. Um, so I think I'm out of time. I'm sure they've been flashing that up, but this comes out of Radix time, so I don't really care. Uh, any questions? Yes. Uh, so what, what types of, so you, you're talking about hardware, what, what, what hardware? Um, so right now with General Motors, we're uh, working on Qualcomm, and Qualcomm's de developing a brand, new op a brand new hardware for the operating system. We've talked to lots of car companies, and they want to work. Uh, the three vendors that we seem, they, they seem to want to work with are Qualcomm, NVIDIA, and uh, Texas Instruments. Those are the three names they have. But this is RHEL, right? We want to be able to run on any operating system. We're not, we're not building the operating system to run on a specific piece of hardware. We want to be a general, a general purpose, so. That's, by the way, a very, very enlightening talk. Yeah. Any other questions? Come on, this will, you'll get less radic. This is good. Where did, where did my idea come for that? That wasn't my idea. That was Alex Lassen. <laughs> oh, to, to get rid of the quad that? To get smaller? Yeah, I'm not sure. But yeah, go ahead. So, so uh, anything, anything would change. We're, we're investigating. Uh, so there's basically about 100 people working on, on Rivos at this point. Anything that we change, you know, find to help say speed of boot, uh, we'll go back into the uh, regular kernel. We'll ba basically go into the upstream kernel. So everything we're working on is going back into RHEL. Um, so right now, I did, uh, I, I'm not the kernel engineer, so I'm not sure if we've had to fix things. We've had to fix a lot of things in Podman. We've, we're you know, working with other parts of the operating system to um, actually even going through the FUSA process, we're updating hundreds of man pages just because we're finding problems in the man pages as we as actually look at them. Yes? Are there any constraints about the RAM size and the boot size? Are there, uh, are there any, I, I'm supposed to be re-asking the question, sorry. Uh, are there any uh, worries about disk size? So, yeah, or, uh, so disk, uh, one of the things I did pull, th this, Slideshow goes on quite a bit longer, um, but I was uh, time it usually takes well over an hour to go through everything. Uh, one of the things we talk about is potentially having uh, separate disks for the QM environment, so that the QM environment can actually accidentally use up all the disk space, so that the ASL environment can. Uh, in, in traditionally, in the car companies, they have lots and lots of partitions, way more partitions than we would normally recommend, um, to but basically for isolation like that. Um, the I.O. stuff is also, would, the I.O. C groups would also um, take, take away the ability to pound the disk and hot, hurt, cause an application not to be able to run. All right, last question. Yes. Do we have any type of monitoring going on to see what's going on? Um, yeah, we, <laughs> so we have these, you, you sound like General Motors. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. So the uh, so what General Motors wants to ma they want to know like the car is running out of memory before the car is running out of memory, or they want to to know when we get to 80 percent CPU things like that. So we are looking in for open source projects. So they come to us and say we need to work this, and we don't want to. You know, in Herta we had to generate brand new code. Uh, we're trying to make sure we get open source projects. So we're looking at different things right now. PC is P. Uh, PCP is the performance copilot, which I think is the way that RHEL right now does things like that. But General Motors wants us to be able to monitor things like uh, uh, special uh, devices. We have to make sure that they can build code to look at uh, GPUs and things like that. So, um, but yeah, the, the PCP right now is, is what we're thinking. But if anybody has suggestions, we're always all, all yes. Anyways, thank you for having me. And Roddick, you can take over now.